Welcome to the Boston Fingerprints Archive project. Um, this is exercise one where we use the data from the archive to familiarize you with uh, 3D data in MeshLab. And so MeshLab is a free software uh, package to work with 3D data. The purpose of this initial exercise is so that you uh, become familiar with the Boston Fingerprint uh, Archive, the data set that we're working with here. Uh, you'll learn how to orient, navigate, and visualize 3D models in MeshLab, some basic skills, so, but some very important ones. Um, and you'll learn to identify common errors in 3D data, which are often caused by data capture methodologies um, or the materiality of the recorded object itself. So when we're using a data set, uh, you want to make sure that you first explore and inspect the data to ensure that is suitable for your research. Uh, and so um, we'll be doing that here. It's also important to be familiar with the common errors and their causes, especially working with uh, reused data, um, because it can affect the quality of the data and your interpretations. So in this exercise, we'll be orienting the 3D data to match up with the alignment of a reference photograph included in the data set. This exercise uh, will also introduce some simple and useful visualization tools that will allow you to quickly judge the suitability of the data set to address your research question. So first, open MeshLab. Uh, as I've done here, you'll want to import the STL files for uh, PH2, wherever you have saved that data set. And you'll notice that there are two STL files available here. And so you can either import them separately or you can click, uh, control click on each of these and you can import them both at the same time. So this will take a little while to import. And here we go. So on the left, you can see the 3D model itself. Note that there are a couple of circles here. Um, and so these three circles are called the trackball. And this allows you to move the 3D model in any direction. Uh, you can also rotate the 3D model by clicking anywhere and clicking and holding anywhere on the screen, moving your mouse. But um, the trackball allows for some finer control. Um, you'll notice the difference when you do this yourself. Um, so on the top right of the screen here, you can see that both files are in the project. We have two, the two STL files here. And you can click the I symbol next to each of these, and it'll turn each of the data sets off in turn. And so when the files are highlighted in yellow, like here or here, that means the changes that you are making down here will only apply to that uh, file. So first, uh, let's turn off the color. So we have the color of the actual shirt here. Let's turn that off. You can see that it's only turned off the color for one of these, this one here. So make sure you do the same by clicking user def for color. And you should have a gray pot shirt. It's kind of the neutral color that MeshLab chooses here. Uh, so to accentuate the topography of the 3D model, shaders can be applied. Um, so shaders are powerful tools. They uh, render the appearance of the surface based on uh, a number of factors. It can include the lighting position, the transparency, the view position, material properties, the shape of the 3D surface. Uh, and there's usually complicated algorithms underlying these. You can find the um, publication on MeshLab's radiant scaling algorithm to get a sense of this. And coincidentally, that's the uh, the shader that we're going to be using here. So navigate to render, shaders, and go down to radiant scaling. You'll notice that this affects both files. So this menu has popped up here. You can increase the contrast here. Uh, you can play around with a couple of these different settings if you like, but uh, mostly we just want to be able to see the geometry of the pot shirt a bit easier. And you can close it when you're done. So once you've gotten to this point, uh, open the reference image for PH2, wherever you've saved that, and put this to one side and have MeshLab in the other. You can kind of adjust things so that you can see them a bit clearer. You can kind of move this out of the way. 
you like. So once you have the reference image for pH2 open, you can zoom in a bit uh, and get a sense for what the actual artifact looked like. So you can see here that the researchers have marked the place of the fingerprint using a little sticker here. Uh, but, so we want to orient the 3D model so that it matches the orientation of the shirt here so we can find that more easily. So it, in a mesh lab, go ahead and orient the 3D model so that it matches roughly the orientation of the pot shirt in the other uh, image. And if you have a mouse wheel, you can zoom in and out and things and make it bigger and you can see it a bit clearer there. Uh, clicking down on the mouse wheel will allow you to pan, but uh, you shouldn't need to do that here. And hopefully you end up uh, with your screen something like this. So if you notice, there are actually some pretty significant gaps in the 3D model. Um, and so if we look at the reference image, we'll actually get an explanation for that. Um, so you can see that there is a dark, shiny glaze here that is uh, corresponding with the location of our areas of null data. So black and shiny surfaces are often really difficult to capture using any digital imaging methods, uh, including structured light scanning, uh, which is the method that was used to capture this data set. So these areas were basically just not recorded by the data capture itself, and now they appear as holes. But the rest of the ceramic is still there, and if we look at where the fingerprint is uh, marked on the pot shirt, we can see a fingerprint emerging out of the um, uh, ceramic fabric here. And that'll take a little while to import. There we are. So, uh, in, in addition to the recording errors caused by the properties of the object, uh, like the black reflective glaze, there are errors that can be caused by the recording process itself. So now that you've got the STL files for PH4, uh, if you change the color of the STLs to user defined and then apply the radiant scaling shader as you did before, right? You might notice that there are some strange gray striations kind of going from bottom left to top right on this pot shirt. Uh, so if we turn off the visibility for the first file, we'll see that this data, you can kind of call it stripey. So it's not a very technical term, but it's very accurate. Um, so this seems, this sort of stripey data seems to occur when the object is slightly out of the field of view of a structured light scanner, or if the scanner wasn't pointing straight on at the surface of the pot shirt at the time of recording. So it has to be kind of held perpendicular to the surface being recorded. Uh, so, because ceramic vessels are not usually flat, this does happen from time to time, but it doesn't usually affect the legibility of the data to this uh, extent. But it's important to be aware of it because you don't want to interpret these striations as surface treatment or something like that. But if we turn on the first STL file and turn off the stripey data one, uh, we can see that it's okay. Uh, obviously, it would have been a bit better if the other scan had worked, but uh, this still provides information itself. So try uh, these steps with another three pot shirts or so from the Boston fingerprint data set. Uh, see if you can orient the 3D models to match the reference image, uh, and then assess whether the fingerprints are defined enough to identify ridge patterns uh, if you want to go that route for your research question. Uh, and Think about what else you can tell from the pottery by looking at these 3D models. So um, are there different stages of manufacture you can see? Are there uh, different ma manufacturing processes? Um, and try some different shaders as well. Some of these might give you some different insights into the pot shards, uh, how it's been made. Uh, some of them won't be very useful, uh, but give it a go. See what works and what doesn't. And then if you find one that works better than the uh, radiant scaling one, take a screenshot of it and add it to your gallery if you're doing that part of the exercises and um, write a long caption reflecting on how this visualization informs it a bit, uh, informs you about the artifact a bit better. Okay, and we'll see you in exercise two.